Okay, good afternoon. Um, we haven't just had lunch, had we? Lunch was two sessions ago. So you're all nice and awake and you haven't got that kind of after lunch sleepy feeling. So no Simon? No Simon? Thank you. Okay, it gets lonely up here when you guys are so quiet out there. Okay, so uh, welcome to this session, uh, The Art of SharePoint Success 2010. Last year I did the same session, or a very similar session, that was called The Art of SharePoint Success. So I thought we'd stick the 2010 on the end to make it sound topical. Did anybody come to that lunchtime session that I did at this event last year? Brilliant. So nobody's heard any of the jokes. Good stuff. Okay, so a couple of things um, off the first slide. Um, so I am Simon Garfield, so more of that in a moment. For those of you doing the, the, the tweeting, uh, at Simon underscore Garfield, um, I, I'm supposed to have a blog, but whoever actually gets time to write anything on these blogs. So if you want to go and see an empty web page, I have an address. Eventually, I keep meaning to turn this session into a sort of, you know, a white paper, a blog article, something like that. But you know, when I actually sit down on a Sunday afternoon, it doesn't always seem like that um, such a good idea after all. Um, you can also email me uh, at my work address, uh, which is simon.garfield at ics.net. I had an email the other day from somebody at Microsoft, and let me get this right. It actually said, they said, Simon, I want to know whether you've got the bandwidth to connect with me this week which I think means that he actually wanted to have a conversation with me. So if anybody wants to reach out and connect with me, you've got some, some details there. Um, so who am I? Well, back in the good old days, it used to be okay just to put a couple of bullet points about what you do, but in order to be fashionable, I've decided to generate my own personal tag cloud. So I'll leave you to read some of the words that are in there. Um, I work for a company called ICS Solutions. Uh, we're Microsoft Gold Partner. We do lots of SharePoint projects. Um, we're sponsoring the events. Our logo uh, is up on the board. And if you want to know anything else about what we do or how we might be able to help, you're just going to see us down on the stand uh, in, the main, in the main area. Uh, I'm the CTO, Chief Technical Officer at ICS. I used to be the SharePoint practice lead. So technically my focus, I say technically, from a product perspective, my focus is very much uh, around SharePoint. Um, over the last three or four years, I used to write Visual Basic 6 software. Anybody need any Visual Basic 6 work doing? Nope, okay. So over the last um, four years, coming from a, a software development background, I've got more and more involved in the softer side of SharePoint stuff. So you'll see some of the things up there. I'm talking about value realization. How do you write your business case? How do you um, do your requirements engineering or your requirements solicitation for SharePoint? How do you get people to actually use the technology once, that it's, been, uh, once it's been deployed? All this type of thing. How can SharePoint help your organization meet its strategic objective? That's the kind of space that, that I work in these days. Why am I here? Uh, I thought long and hard about this. Ultimately, of course, I am here to make the world a better place. And I'm going to do that by talking about SharePoint. Don't believe me? So the dark side will explain a little bit about a problem with SharePoint that people kind of don't talk about too much. Then the art of SharePoint success will give you a potential solution to that problem. And then new into this session from the difference from what I did last year is the step by step. So last year I stood up and I talked for a while about the art of SharePoint success and people nodded and they wrote notes and it all seemed to make some kind of sense. And then a client actually said to me a few months ago, he said, Simon, that's great. We're really into all of this, but what do I actually do? So I had to write a report which said, well, you take all of this stuff that I've just talked to you about and here are 10 steps that you can go through to make sure that you get success with your SharePoint investment. So we did the questions, I would like to know roughly, you know, get an idea of who's in the room. So I know they did this at the keynote in terms of the 2003 stroke 2007 users. Um, business people, non-technical people, 40% technical people. Whoa, okay, interesting, not too sure. A couple of people, yeah, okay, I know. Uh, and I always ask this question, just in case you suddenly realise that you are in the wrong room and you would like to leave, now is your chance to do so uh, without embarrassing yourself. Okay, good, right, fine. So we'll assume that we're all here for this session. Interesting, the mix between business and technical people. I was um, quite surprised on the IW track last year that the rooms you know, were, were pretty much packed out um, and the amount of interest, the fact that we've got two tracks, an information worker, uh, and the kind of the softer side shows how important this type of thing is to, uh, to you know, to SharePoint success. 
I'm not going to go through all of these. I just want to say that all of the work that I do, these are some of the people that have influenced me. Uh, so a bit of a bi bibliography, if you like. So lots of people that are the great and the good from the SharePoint world and from the Microsoft world. Uh, I also have to give credit, obviously, to colleagues and clients because I've developed this working with colleagues and clients. And I've also got a comma in my mum at the bottom there. I just want to say thanks to my mum because I never get a chance to do that. And I'm never likely to be given um, any sort of Oscar or award. So I thought this was my best opportunity. Okay, the dark side. Now, be honest, who's expecting to see a graphic with either Darth Vader or a Pink Floyd album? Yeah? Nope. So I avoided that rather obvious cliche. I have to say in the speaker room earlier on, I put them in and then I took them out again because I just thought it was too obvious. So the dark side, okay. So SharePoint is an absolute phenomenal success, okay? It's been in the marketplace for 10, 11 years, depending which press release you read. It's got, um, it's been through four, four generations or three evolution, uh, four evolutions of the product. 100 million licenses sold worldwide, a billion dollars in sales revenue for Microsoft. So hurrah for Microsoft. Um, hugely successful. But there is another side to it that people don't discuss very much. Now, I was on a, the Combined Knowledge Admin training course last week, just trying to um, you know, keep up to date with the changes in the technology. And somebody on that course actually said uh, at one point, they said, you know, about 70% of SharePoint projects fail, I hear. And we had a debate about it. He's in the room and he's smiling at me. So, um, so I'm not going to go into the details of the... It's interesting that somebody should say that on a SharePoint training course. This is something that some clients have to told me very recently. So this is an extract from a report that I did uh, after doing a couple of days discovery um, with a new client, an international insurance provider who you would definitely recognize. And this is what they told us, and I was just playing back to them what they told me. Over the last three years, they've invested two and a half million pounds in implementing the SharePoint platform but they don't perceive any significant returns on that investment or any uh, widespread business benefits. And this is just one example. This is, um, again, from the, from the same report, and you can see here there's kind of 10 reasons, 10 challenges that we focused on, uh, 10 problem areas, if you like. Now, about, uh, oh, let's see, 1999, maybe even before that, there was a report done into why so many IT um, projects fail. Um, the Standish Group, it's known as the Chaos Report, and they looked at IT projects generally, and based on their research, uh, they said, strangely, approximately 70% of IT projects fail, whatever you mean by fail. And they gave a list of reasons. And actually, if you look at that report from 1999, and look at the reasons that this client gave me in February 2010, they're pretty much the same. So I'm not going to go through all of those, but I mean, does anybody have any resonance with any of those? Yeah. All of them. Okay, good. We're all in the right session. It's going so well so far. Uh, this is a different organisation, um, but again, as you can see, I mean, I've just picked off ones of you know people I've spoken to in the last couple of weeks or months. Really, this is a strategic marketing and communications consultancy, and they said to us, "We've got SharePoint. We've deployed it. We've got a document management thing going on, and there's a, a few intranet sites set up." SharePoint exists, but nobody uses it. And now what they want to do is they want to get some value out of the investment that they've made. I haven't put it on the slide because I didn't want it to get out there in the world. But Microsoft phoned us the other day, and they said, oh, we've, we've got a bit of a problem with one of our clients that you might want to get involved in, one of our global accounts. They spent 12, they spent 12 million pounds developing a new, um, let's just call it SharePoint system, okay? I don't want to identify these people. And it's only in test. They've not managed to get it out of the test environment. And kind of nobody's really using it, and they don't know what to do with it. And a new CIO's come in and wants to know what the hell you spent 12 and a half million quid on. So yes, Microsoft have got all of these success stories. You can go to their website. You can look at them. You saw a lot of the logos on the video that was running this morning in the keynote. Huge success for many organizations. We've got you know, case studies on our own website as well. And you go to all of the other Microsoft partners. But there is this dark side. There's so many organizations out there that either haven't deployed SharePoint at all. Who's got SharePoint licenses on their EA that they haven't deployed yet? No? Okay. Well, I guess the, the fact that you're at a SharePoint conference means you've got an interest, so you've probably deployed it. But from Microsoft's perspective, that's a huge challenge. Lots of licenses have been sold with EAs, but they haven't deployed them. The ones that they have deployed, some of them aren't demonstrating value. Nobody's using them, the example that I've already given. So Microsoft is very, very aware of this. And some of the things that we're going to look at today um, are the steps that Microsoft are taking to solve the problem. 
So the art of SharePoint success. I've changed this a little bit since, since last year, but basically the principles are still the same. So we're going to look at these four things, and I'm going to tie it all together at the end. So SharePoint governance, user adoption, change management, and value. There's actually two things under value that I want to talk about. One of them is strategy, and the other one is, is value realization or business case. Let's keep an eye on the time, because we don't have any red lights flashing to tell us that we're late. Okay, so the first thing. So who's got SharePoint deployed? Okay, who has a SharePoint plan strategy written down? Mm, okay, so pretty much everybody put their hand up to say, yes, we've got SharePoint deployed. Um, pretty much nobody put their hand up to say that we've, we've got a plan. So this is a quote from uh, Forrester, Forrester Research, renowned IT industry analysts. Achieving business value with SharePoint investments requires methodical strategic planning to minimize risk and maximize potential benefits. Sounds a bit dull, doesn't it? Okay, so if you guys have all deployed SharePoint, but you haven't, you're all by your own admission, you haven't got a plan, then according to Forrester, you're not achieving business value. I'm not going to ask anybody. Who would say that they really do get business value out of SharePoint? Mm, a few people, not too many. Okay, interesting. Right. So have we got a plan? So what we've got down here is we've got a Google map showing uh, how to get from my house in um, Petersfield to Microsoft's offices in Victoria around, around the corner. The point is that my plan says where I'm starting from, and it says where I'm going to end up, and it tells me how I'm getting there. Okay? Sounds obvious, but hey, nobody in the room had a plan. So I said you need to have a start point and an end point. This is an extract from a document that a customer sent to me about 12 months ago. Um, this, was, this was taken from their requirements document. In essence, staff want to work, to get work better together, to share knowledge, to work informally, to communicate, to connect across boundaries and to innovate. Who wouldn't want to do that? Sounds great, doesn't it? But the key question is, how will you know when you have done it? Okay? To be fair to them, in this document, the next paragraph down said, what is missing is a set of clear, measurable objectives. Okay? So they knew they'd got the problem, but they didn't actually know what the solution was. They didn't know how to articulate the end point as far as SharePoint was concerned for them. Again, in the combined knowledge training course that I was on last week, um, Steve Smith, who's the, the owner and is, is organizing this, you'll have seen him on the, on the keynote, we were having a conversation, and we actually agreed, as did everybody else in the classroom, that to actually get true value out of SharePoint, 10 years. It's a decade. You're talking years, not weeks or months, to really get full value out of SharePoint. Not just point solutions, but for SharePoint to change the way that everybody in your organization, or at least the value-creating people in your organization, um, behaves and works. So we know we need a plan, we know we need clear objectives, but there's a bit of a problem. And the first problem is, what exactly is SharePoint? How can you have a plan for something if you don't know what it is? So this is Steve Balmer. Um, nice photo of him there. How could you not trust that man? He's the uh, CEO at Microsoft and gave the opening keynote speech at the SharePoint conference in Las Vegas. Who managed to, to make it over to Vegas? Yeah, a few people. Okay. So this is, this is what he said. He said, what is SharePoint? It's another question I get asked when visiting customers. It's kind of magical in a certain way. It's a special kind of product. It's kind of like an operating system. Well, thanks, Steve. But actually, that's not all that helpful. How do I sell that to my financial director? How do I go and talk to my project managers or my project management office in my organization and tell them that what they need is a product which is kind of magical and a bit special? And can they sign this check, please? Okay, that's, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work. Whilst we're on the subject, I'm doing a lunchtime session tomorrow where I'm gonna focus in on this idea of, of what is SharePoint a little bit more. So you have a problem, you need to define what SharePoint is. And there's all sorts of different answers. Um, I heard a great one the other day, which is SharePoint is a website with a database at the back end. <laughs> Makes you kind of wonder what we're all doing here, doesn't it, for three days. But hey, who can argue with that? I mean, you know, it's a nice, nice simple description. Um, so there's lots of different de answers and lots of different descriptions. One of the best ones I ever heard and the one that I really like is this idea of SharePoint being an information workplace platform. Great, so it's a platform upon which you can build an information workplace. 
but what's an information workplace? So this is an idea that's come across from a lady called Erica Driver, who used to work for Forrest, but she's not with them anymore. But she talks about this idea of the information workplace as being the workplace of the future. And she talks about the seven tenets of the information workplace, which I'll never remember all of them off the top of my head. But she says that it's, it's seamless so that you can, um, you can bring in data and information from all of your different systems into one place. It's contextual, so that the information that you need is available to you at the point at which you're working. Uh, what are the other ones? It's social. So I'm obviously all familiar with the, you know, the social computing aspects of uh, SharePoint 2010, and I can never remember the seven of off the top of my head. But it's a vision for the future, of way, a, a way in which people will work in your organisation. And in order to have a platform to build the information workplace, she said, or Forrester said, that these are all of the different functional components. And hey, we can probably all recognise this. It looks a little bit like the Microsoft graphics, doesn't it? Okay? So that's one answer. SharePoint is an information workplace platform, but you need to understand what an information workplace is. So that's a little bit around the strategy side of things. Let's turn our attention to business value. Who's either in the past written a business case for SharePoint or is faced with the task of doing it in the future. Okay, got quite a few people. It's a bit tricky, huh? So how did, this is from a guy called Toby Ward and what he's actually looking at here is he's looking at how businesses measure the return on investment for intranets, not SharePoint specifically, but for intranets. But I think this works really, really well. And I have to be honest, I don't know what the sample size or the research methods were, but it looks pretty good to me. So how important is intranet return on investment? And you can see up here that it's very important, so it's somewhat important. Everybody says it's important, return on investment. I must know how much money I'm making. Do you measure it? No, not at all. Okay, so that's pretty much, um, I think that pretty much fits with what I hear from most of the clients that I talk to. They all want to know what the business case is at the beginning and what the return on investment is, but they're not prepared to take any effort to actually measure it. And there's a good reason for that. So as you can see here, most analysts contend that precise ROI measurement is not possible. Uh, and I would say that can be uh, you know, particularly true for SharePoint as well. It's very difficult to measure the return on investment. For example, what's the return on investment in your telephone system? You know? Would you try and measure the return on investment in your telephone system? No. Am I suggesting that you should walk into your financial director's office and say, hello, FD, I'd like you to sign up £100,000, please, pick a number, to implement SharePoint. And when he or she says to you, what's your business case, I am not suggesting that you turn around to your financial director and say, oh, well, you don't measure the financial return on investment on your telephone system, do you? Because they'll just throw you out. Okay? The point is, is that Share, one of the answers to what is SharePoint is it's, an infra it's a piece of infrastructure. It's an information infrastructure. It's something that's a, an enabler. It gives you capabilities that you go out and you use them and it makes your organization, it makes your workers more effective at what they do, like a telephone system. Quite what people will do with it when you give these capabilities to them can be a little bit hard to predict. So if you put a collaboration platform in place, is it really that easy to work out what the cause and effect will be? So there's been some, some good research that shows that the cause and effect chain for SharePoint solutions is so long that that's one of the difficulties in measuring the return on investment. But nevertheless, you do have to focus on, on something. You have to have a hook to get your business case uh, across and to you know, ultimately get the check signed off in your organization. So we talked to uh, our clients about focusing on value. There are a couple of examples here. So we were talking to an organization in the public sector um, a few weeks ago and they wanted to collaborate, we must collaborate, set us up a SharePoint platform and then everything will be wonderful, we'll be collaborating. And I said, okay, so but what are you, you know, obviously in, in public sector, especially at the moment, there's a lot of pressure to show value for, you know, for the money that you're spending. So I said, okay, so what is it that your organization is trying to do? And I went to their website and looked on their corporate objectives and I got out their annual report and all this sort of stuff and picked out some key words. And you know, predictably, cutting costs was in there. Okay, everybody wants to cut costs, yeah? So cutting costs was in there, and I said, okay, um, who or what in your organization is, has got the most cost associated to it? And they said, um, we have lots of lawyers and economists, and they cost us an absolute fortune, and anything that we can do to make their lives better or to make them more efficient or so they don't have to spend time doing nonsense and can focus on their, on their core tasks, 
that would be beneficial. So that's one way of doing it, focusing on the users, focusing on the people that either generate the value or create the costs for you in your organization. I spoke to an investment bank, and I was having the same conversation with them. I said, where does the value come from in your organization? Who's most closely associated with whatever it is that you do for your customers? And they had a think about it. They said, well, predictably, in an investment bank, it's the investment bankers, the people that do the due diligence on the different financial products that we have. I said, right, OK. I said, and how do they work? What do they do? Do they work in teams? Do they share information across you know, different geographic offices? No, not really. Um, they're pretty much rocket scientists, I was told. They all kind of just sit in a room and do what they need to do on their own. So under those circumstances, deploying a collaboration platform for people that work on their own probably isn't a good idea. It's not to say that SharePoint isn't a good idea, but the idea of collaborations isn't a good idea. Okay? So just understanding value. Another example, somebody came to one of the seminars that I did for the police force, and they said anything that we can do that we can link to increasing detection rates is, you know, is, is, a great, is a great business case for us. So don't just think in terms of um, financial business case. There's a great um, debate going on at the moment. There's a guy called um, Daniel Rasmus, who's Microsoft Director for Insights. He's a futurist, and his joke is so good that I'm actually going to tell you his joke. He's, when he gave his presentation, he said, I'm a futurist. He said, I've got to predict what software will be doing in 10 years' time. He said, the great thing about being a futurist is you can't be wrong today, which I thought was a brilliant job description. Um, so his argument is that the focus of SharePoint is all around knowledge management, okay? A bit of a passe term now, but it's all around knowledge and information management, okay? And traditional business cases that you'll find that your financial director will like will be based on things like return on investment, uh, total cost of ownership, uh, net present value, internal rate of return, all those good old-fashioned financial metrics. Now, Daniel Rasmus and other people argue that those types of industrial age metrics works really well in the industrial age, but they're not well suited to the knowledge economy, okay? And then, of course, you've got the financial directors to say, yeah, that's fine, but I'm not signing the checks, so I know what I get back for it. Okay, so we talked a little bit about what is SharePoint. We've talked a little bit about the difficulties in, in getting a business case. Um, what you really need in an organization is this idea of a plan, something, something to give your um, SharePoint strategy some structure. Okay? Now, these are just examples about the way that I start conversations with clients. It doesn't work for everybody. Um, this is from a company called Razorfish, uh, and you'll find them if you do a, a Bing search. You won't do a Google search, of course. If you do a Bing search for Razorfish, you'll find this. This is their intranet maturity model. So again, it's intranet um, generally rather than SharePoint specifically, but this can be a really good way. We had um, uh, a national charity come to us recently where Microsoft had just given them SharePoint licenses. Okay, that was their charitable contribution. And this organization didn't know whether to actually deploy those licenses that had been given. Great, you've been given the licenses, but do we want to spend the time, the effort, and the money actually deploying those licenses? What are we going to get out of that investment? So we use this to start the conversation with them. So I'm not going to go through um, the whole thing here in any detail, but just I'll just go through the first couple and you'll, you'll get the idea. So looking at intranets generally, this is communication and information sharing intranet. So this is pretty much just um, a publishing mechanism where you're using SharePoint to just publish information out into the organization, very much what we would probably all consider to be a traditional in, uh, intranet. You might have some document libraries on there for your health and safety policy and all of those corporate level policies, but nothing collaborative. Your business benefits here, which people often overlook, are you saving yourself money on printing? You don't need to print out you know, a newsletter. Okay, we send it by email, but we don't need to print out health and safety um, manuals or um, staff handbooks or those types of things. We can just put them up onto, onto the intranet. Then you get the idea of the self-service intranet. So this is where, at its most basic level, people can just go along to the HR section on the intranet, download an expenses form if that's, you know, that's what you need to do fill in your expenses form and away you go. So your benefits here are that people are able to do things themselves without taking the time and the effort of the HR department. So you start to get some business benefits. Then you move on through collaboration, where you're starting to get benefits that come from team working and improved, um, uh, improved group effectiveness, uh, all the way through up to the top. So the other thing that Razorfish do say is they say this consolidated workplace interface the idea of this is it's like a single screen that you can go to, and it's your window into your electronic world in your organization. 
and everything that you need to do and all the information that you need to find can be accessed through a single, a single point, a single interface. It's very much the same as Erica Driver's Intermotion Workplace that she was talking about. Both Erica Driver and Razorfish agree that there's probably no organisations in the world that have achieved level six. It's aspirational. That's, that's the direction that we're all driving in. So possibly this might be one way that you could start to structure your SharePoint strategy. Another way, some of you will probably be familiar with this. I think this has come from, um, from Microsoft originally. But this is the idea of implementing SharePoint as a set of services. So rather than going out there into the world and trying to find out what your users are doing and, and generate requirements and write out requirements documents and things like that, um, you basically you provide SharePoint as a set of services across your organization. Um, and you know, so, so my sites, for instance, so let's take the, the department, for instance. So the service might be, I'm a department head. I can go to an intranet site. I can fill in a form to request that my, bless you, to request that my department can its own intranet site. Um, that form goes through a workflow process. Uh, and then eventually my site is created for me. Uh, maybe my budget gets charged as well. Um, well. I haven't actually got it on there, but you might um, have, for instance, processes, might be projects, and that service would be different because the users can create their own sites, for instance. So different services used for different purposes in the organisation. This might be another way that you choose to implement your SharePoint strategy. Uh, finally, on the subject of SharePoint strategy, and this for me, this is how I got into SharePoint with an interest in knowledge management. So this, as you can see, again, is taken from 1999. Um, this was done in the Harvard Business Review, where um, some uh, researchers looked at a consulting organization and looked at how they do knowledge management. And to cut a long story short, um, they basically said, look, we know there's two types of knowledge. There's explicit stuff, which you can write down. You can put in process diagrams, put it in spreadsheets, presentations, Word documents. And there's implicit knowledge, that stuff that's just in people's heads and you can't get it out. It's expert-based, okay? And in order to have a good knowledge management strategy, you need to understand as an organization which is the most important type of information or the most important type of knowledge to what you do. And then you should focus a little bit more on that. All organizations will have both, or most organizations will have both, but you will normally find that depending on the type of work that you do, you will favor one or the other. So for example, if you find yourself solving the same problem over and over again for your customers, and it's a very repeatable service, it's likely to be um, process-based, um, and you're likely to have things like, you're likely to be focused on standardization for lower costs, okay? So use, reusing Word templates, reusing PowerPoint templates, um, basing your next proposal on the last good one that we wrote, that type of thing, okay? On the other hand, if you're in a situation where you've got very bespoke problems, maybe high-level consulting organizations, where you're solving different problems every time, and it's really based, like the investment bankers, it's really based on expert knowledge, then you'll favor the personalized uh, personalization strategy. So codification is putting people in touch with documents, and personalization is putting people in touch with other people. So SharePoint 2010, obviously, I mean, SharePoint 2007 was good. SharePoint 2010, with its uh, increased focus on the social aspects really gives us the ability now to implement both of these strategies. SharePoint governance, uh, you know, a huge topic. SharePoint governance is the reason I don't get invited to parties anymore, because when I get there, I talk about SharePoint governance, and after a while, people stop inviting you. So what is SharePoint governance? Um, who's, not, who's not familiar with SharePoint governance, or who's not heard of it? Okay, a couple of people. So this is really, in the, since two, SharePoint 2007 came out, this has probably been one of the strongest themes that has come out of the SharePoint community to the point at which it's almost been done to death. So this is um, Microsoft's, uh, it's not Microsoft's quote, it's a quote you'll find on the Microsoft TechNet website. It's about people, policy, processes, some of the important things to pick out on this though. It resolves ambiguity. It manages short and long-range uh, long goals, so, um, mitigates conflicts within an organization, covers your usage and design, and gives you a framework to measure success. So this really, some elements of this, tie back to the strategy that we were looking at in the, last, in the last section. This quote is actually from a guy called Craig Roth, who works for the Burton Group, uh, and Microsoft have adopted his definition of governance. Almost as important as what governance is, in fact, probably easier to understand, is what governance isn't. 
So I went to work with an organisation recently and they called us in because we've got to focus on SharePoint governance. And actually what they thought SharePoint governance was, was they thought it was their operations manual. They thought they'd done governance when they'd got a, a manual or a document that told their SharePoint DB, sorry, their SQL Server DBA what the particular policy was for defragmenting the database. They thought that that, that in, their, in their language was governance. It's absolutely not. That's operations. That's a much, much lower level. Governance is all about the policies that guide those, those lower level uh, management features. So as you can see on the slide, SharePoint governance provides a framework to create your maintenance manual. It says who's responsible for it. It says where it's kept and, and how, what the change control should be around it. Uh, SharePoint governance is not the best practices or the rule book itself. What it is, is it's the policies that define how that gets created. The most important thing on there is SharePoint governance is something that you cannot implement overnight. Okay? The organization, the uh, International Insurance Organization that spent the two and a half million on SharePoint and not delivered any business benefits, it was one of my case studies at the beginning. Um, the guy that called me into that organization had been given a personal objective by his boss that he had to do SharePoint governance. And when he'd done it, he had to go back and say, look, I've done SharePoint governance, there it, there it is. Difficult in the extreme. But that's where the 10 steps at the end came from. Okay, so more of that in a moment. This is a model that I've developed based partly on information from Forrester, partly on information from Microsoft, uh, and partly on our, our, on our own experience as well. So as an absolute starting point, if you're a small organization, if you don't have any governance that you would recognize, or if you're about to start with SharePoint and you want to kind of grow your governance model, the first thing I would suggest that you do is start with this team here. Just get together a SharePoint strategy team, a steering committee, an intranet committee, call them what you will. But what you've got here is a group of about six people, um, ideally, with only one representative from the IT department. That's hugely important. You want to bring in people, possibly most organizations, you want to bring in HR, uh, and you probably want to bring in marketing or internal communications as well. Okay? Because those two groups of people, or those two functions in an organization, they actually have the power to drive change. Okay, so for instance, HR can come up with various policies which incentivize people to do things in a certain way, um, and the marketing and internal communications people, of course, have the ability to, to kind of get the message out there. The other thing that you want to do is you want to bring in a senior, or as senior as you can get, a senior uh, executive sponsor, people in the business. This is something that's hugely, hugely important. You will not drive successful IT, um, SharePoint projects out of an IT department. I've never seen it done. You quite often find an IT department that says, we've deployed SharePoint ourselves, and look, we're the IT department, are collaborating, and it's all wonderful, but you very rarely find that that gets out of the IT department. The key is that, the, the key question to take back is, who's got the problem, and who will get the benefit? The people in the business. So you have to make them, as much as is possible, accountable not just responsible, but accountable for the success or failure of your SharePoint project. Not the IT department, but the business users. And when it's written down to say that the head of project or the head of HR or the head of customer service, when it's written down to say that they take responsibility and accountability for success, that motivates them a little bit more to actually get the technology used. So that would be your starting point, potentially. And you may stop there if you're a small organization and you have a small SharePoint deployment. As a second stage, you might then choose to roll out the, the rest of these. You'll always need the IT service hosting team. So the IT service hosting team, in large organizations, you tend to find, so we did some work with the European Central Bank recently as an example, and in their IT function, they had um, uh, database storage, database administration, platform services, um, application development, a support desk, a whole variety of different people that ran the IT function. So what we say for the SharePoint IT services hosting team is get one or two representatives from either each of those groups, bring them together, and get them to recognize themselves as we are the IT, um, SharePoint IT service hosting team. We are responsible for SharePoint, or responsible for the TIM and for keeping the software running. The business impact team, so these are the people that are responsible for two, two things. Responsible for user adoption, 
which is really focused on getting individual users to change their behavior and do things that you want them to do. Uh, and it's also focused on business engagement. So the business engagement is where you've got a group of people who understand SharePoint and what it can do and what the vision is, and they go out into the organization and they will evangelize about the technology, but importantly, they'll have a two-way dialogue with people in the organization. Try and get under the skin of what it is that workers in your organization are actually doing, and then try and map that back to how SharePoint could be used to benefit them. So as an example, the European Central Bank that I was just talking about, they rolled out SharePoint as a collaboration platform for all 2,000 of their workers. Then what they did was they got their business impact team to actually go out into different parts of the organization and say, look, here is a collaboration service. So that means that everybody has the same functionality available to them. Let's see how you could use this functionality to benefit you in what you do. And we'll send in some people who've got some good technical knowledge, we'll work with you, we'll build a couple of site collections for you, and actually you know, make sure that you've got the support and the ideas that you need. Okay? So that's taking the idea of a service uh, and rolling it out across the organization. A couple of things, it's never complete um, green field. So there will always be people in your organization or uh, there will people or bodies or groups in your organization that have something to do with IT governance or information governance and you need to bring them in uh, to the conversation. The SharePoint user forum is probably a bad description because it's got the word SharePoint in there. So it's probably better if you just make it a user forum and that's just one way of getting this dialogue going with the people in your organization. I said that Microsoft have got a real focus on solving these types of problems as well. Uh, Microsoft have just released a paper called the oh, Center, of Excellence, Center of Excellence for Information Workers or something along those lines. It's about a 20 page paper. Uh, I'm not gonna take you through the detail, but this is their idea of having an information worker, not SharePoint, an information worker, Center of Excellence, okay? Um, to go with all of this, They've got various roles and responsibilities in a spreadsheet. Um, you can see, you know, it's got the, the governance model in there, the project management. So this is a very sophisticated model that you might set up to kind of get, to get SharePoint, not SharePoint. This is a sophisticated model that you might use to link the use of Microsoft technologies back to what knowledge workers do in your organization. Okay, and all of the things that go on around there. So you've got the technical stuff and the user adoption, everything that we're talking about today. If you're interested, let me know and I'll, uh, I'll give you the reference, but you should be able to find it through a quick Google. So you've got these ideas really of three stages almost of governance that you could set up. A single committee, a three-tier committee, or uh, a three-tier model, or potentially something very sophisticated um, like this. Now bear in mind that Microsoft has developed this for their top 100 global accounts. Okay, so these are quite big organizations. Change management. I often say this, this is where I roll out all my cliches from when I go into workshops. Ah, I say there's no such thing as a SharePoint project. There are only change projects. And then I just kind of like nod and look wise, at which point I normally get thrown out. But it's, it's a key point. There are, I mean, I don't know, I remember years ago I had a debate with somebody. Somebody was trying to say, well, there are such things as technology projects. Somebody said, for instance, if I was going to change a plug on a photocopier, that's a technology project. I said, no, 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 I said, it's not. That's an organizational change project because you're, by changing that plug, you're giving people the capability to print information <coughs> and to share it with people rather than having to walk downstairs so they can do it quicker. So even a small example like that, everything that you do with technology has an impact on the business. Power and politics. So again, Toby Ward, the greatest barrier to intranets, brackets at SharePoint, success, is politics. Technology, budget, and skill set are all secondary barriers. The intranet is a political football. Does anybody not agree with that? Does anybody have any experience of politics being their biggest barrier to success? Okay, there's pretty much about a third of the room. Just a, a couple of quick examples. Um, about 18 months ago, just before, just after the financial crisis, uh, so that was not this Christmas, but the one just gone, I was talking to a client who we'd done some work for previously, a uh, big financial organization, and we got a phone call from their IT manager, Simon said, 
if we want to do a collaboration platform, we want to use SharePoint to, to, to roll out a collaboration platform across our organization. I said, that's, that's great. I said, um, I said, have you got any budget? He said, yeah, he said, we've got 350,000. I said, that's great. I said, uh, business case been approved? He said, oh, we, don't need, we don't need a business case. It's not, not gonna be one of those. What he didn't take into consideration was that he was the IT department trying to roll out a collaboration solution based on SharePoint. Meanwhile, they'd already got an intranet that was run by the internal communications team um, and the technology was actually managed by the IT department but in a, in a different part. What basically happened, because we phoned him back a couple of weeks later, he said, oh, you know, that 350,000 or so I've got, he said, it's, it's gone. He said, somebody's taken away my budget so I'll have to get it back to you next year. And basically what had happened was the people that were running the intranet looked at SharePoint and went, that looks a little bit like what I'm doing and we really don't want you to do that because that's my power base. A few people had a few words with a few people by the coffee machine and the budget got pulled. We had exactly the same thing happen in a, in a huge um, central government um, department that we were working in uh, about 12 months ago. They spent 150,000 building a SharePoint collaboration pilot environment, yeah? Ready to roll it out into a live environment. Just after they'd set it up, another group in that organization who'd spent two years looking at what their document management system was going to be, but hadn't yet reported, they turned around and said, there is no way that you're deploying SharePoint, which could be used as a document management system, even though that's not your intention. There's no way that you're deploying that until we've reported on our two years of research into document management systems. And basically what happened was somebody had a word with somebody and that was about 12 months ago, that organization has still only got a few pilot sites set up on their 150,000 um, pound investment in SharePoint, okay? So politics is absolutely the biggest barrier to success. One of the reasons, just to bring in, you can't have a, uh, any sort of IT presentation without a good old Dilbert cartoon. So one of the reasons why politics and power um, is um, such a barrier is because you know, it changes things. So here, for instance, just something really simple. I can't let you telecommute because then I wouldn't be able to manage you. Okay? SharePoint changes things. It changes processes. It can change the balance of power. Many of you have probably heard about this idea about the democratization of information, making, uh, taking information away from the people that that kind of hold on to it and sharing it out across an organization. So change, we were looking at change management. So change needs to be, and I'm quoting I think from the SharePoint best practice book, you know the big thick blue book, Bill English, yeah? Say yes, Simon? Just making sure that you're all still there. So they say that um, change has to be participative, I struggle with this, participative, collaborative, and from the ground up, from the bottom up. Um, there are some organizations where the managing director sits in, a, in, a, um, in an office in the corner of the room, in the corner of the building, and sends out an email and says, we're going to change everything in our organization, and from now on, you will all do it this way. And pretty much people look at that email and go, mm, yeah, okay, only if you ask, and then they carry on doing things uh, the way that they wanted to do them anyway. So it can be very difficult to, to affect change. This is taken from... Um, uh, report that we did for a client and this is basically trying to get across the idea of incremental steps so each circle here this is again based on the idea of rolling out SharePoint as a set of services it doesn't have to be that way so each of these uh, loops is basically a full project life cycle um, going through you know requirements or, or uh, a design planning and design build it test it and roll it out okay so small incremental steps if you can if you can get SharePoint in place very very thin layer of functionality but then take user feedback and start to roll out new functionality every couple of weeks, every month. That's about the right sort of, the right sort of pace. <coughs> user adoption. Who's got a user adoption strategy for SharePoint? Hey, okay, a couple of people, but not so many. So along with your SharePoint strategy of this is how SharePoint will deliver value to our organization, we would strongly recommend that you have a um, SharePoint user adoption strategy, which to be honest is just a written down statement of how you're going to get people to use this wonderful new solution that you're rolling out, whatever it may be. There's a number of different things that you can use to structure uh, a user adoption strategy. So research into user adoption goes back, I think, to the 1940s. <coughs> so um, Everett Rogers, 
did some research in the 1940s, which was, believe it or not, around seed technology for North American farmers. Apparently, it's still applicable to SharePoint. So what he basically showed was that um, when deciding whether to adopt a new technology or a new innovation, people go through this, this process. They learn about it. They get persuaded to use it. They kind of make a decision. They have a go, and then they decide whether it was or, the right, was, or was not the right thing for them to do. Okay? So there's loads of information that you, you can look up about this. But the key point is that this is one way that you could structure a strategy. So user adoption techniques, there's things like um, you could do you know, a poster campaign. Okay? I worked with an organization recently. We talked to them about SharePoint services, and they branded their collaboration service as collaborate. And that took them a two-week competition to come up with that, where they in invited the whole organization to, um, to cast a vote. <coughs> And they came up with this idea of collaborate. But the point is that they'd, they'd, created, they'd created a brand for it. They started to get this idea of, of knowledge. Um, what else did they do? Oh, they printed off pens and mouse mats as well. It was all, all really good techniques in terms of demand generation. Other things that they did was they had things like um, the concept of easy first steps. So the idea is that the first time you go to this new collaboration platform or this new solution, and you go to the home page, there's... Um, a series of about six different steps that you go through, nice and easy, and when you get through to the end of those six steps, you've done something wonderful. And the idea is that your first experience with this new technology platform is a positive one. That's the important thing. If you just go to it and you don't know what to do with it, that can be not so good. So there's a whole range of different techniques, and what this does is it gives you a structure that you can actually put those techniques against. That was back in the 1940s. Uh, in the 1990s, a guy called Jeffrey Moore came along and produced a book, wrote a book called uh, Crossing the Chasm. And it's a marketing Bible. Anybody read Crossing the Chasm? Yeah? Okay. Marketing Bible, and it's about how to get your technologies, uh, how to market your technology and to do strategic marketing around high-tech startups. But there's some good stuff in there that really kind of plays across here. So here we've got, in any, the idea is, is that any um, population of people you'll find this distribution. Um, so you've got the innovators, the people that just want to use technology for the sake of it. So they're the guys and girls that are outside the uh, O2 shop six weeks before the phone comes out. Anybody got an iPad? I keep asking this. Got any iPads here yet? No? Okay. So maybe no innovators in the room. Mm, don't know. Then the early adopters are often also called visionaries. So they're people that are not just interested in the technology, but they're interested in the application of the technology. Okay? So there's, there's an iPad. How can I use this to make my sales force more productive, for instance? Okay? And then over here, you've got the majority. Now, the key to this is that people over here will only adopt a new innovation when they see people who they perceive to be like them already adopting it. Okay? And that's the key reason why the IT department saying we're using SharePoint doesn't usually break out because the rest of the organization is thinking, well, you know, to be honest, geeky guys and girls playing with geeky toys, we're not really interested. So what you've got to do is you've got to get this, basically you've got to get the momentum building over here so that people see people they perceive to be like themselves using this new technology. Finally, on the subject, uh, I think finally, on the subject of user adoption, this is something that we've just come across recently, and this is something that, that Microsoft are, are using um, at the moment. Uh, there's a, and, and forgive me, because I, I don't have the reference in here, but 10 times your influence. So somebody's done some research, and what they're basically saying is that if you want to encourage people um, to change their behavior, then there's these, there's these different um, areas that you can focus on. And what they're saying is that if you put in place techniques that focus on four or more of these different areas, you have 10 times your influence to change the way that they behave. Okay? So just to go through this very quickly. So to make the undesirable desirable, well, that can really be done through communication um, and through, um, through internal, internal, internal marketing messages. Overinvest in skill building, obviously that relates really back to the training. The harness to peer pressure, that comes back a little bit to this idea of uh, people only adopting things they see people like themselves to be adopting. Find strength in numbers, so you might do that through pilot groups or going out into the organization and finding people uh, who will be an advocate for what you're trying to do. 
um, so that you're getting the same message coming from people at the top of the organization. Design rewards and demand accountability. So this is where you might have your HR department involved. Classic example here. Knowledge management systems uh, at the end of the um, 1990s tended to fail. Um, one of the reasons that they failed was because, and it's only one of the reasons, was because a knowledge management system seemed to revolve around the idea of we'll have a big repository and we'll put all of our knowledge in there. Okay? And what lots of organizations did was they said, in fact, I had a customer do this this year. Yeah, this year, just before Christmas, actually. And they, what they've done is they've incentivized people to put documents into the knowledge base. The more documents you put in the knowledge base, the more bonus that you get, um, you know, the more money that you get, basically. Well, that's kind of nonsense, to be honest, because putting a document into a knowledge base doesn't generate any value for anybody at all. All it does is mean that you get a bigger knowledge base, which people don't reuse. The key to things like that is to incentivize people for reuse of the knowledge. So every time that you reuse something that was in the knowledge base, then you should be incentivized, you should be rewarded for that, because that's what actually delivers the value. Uh, and finally, change the environment. <coughs> collaboration, take collaboration as an example. Collaboration is not all about using SharePoint. So there's, uh, I don't do interior design and stuff like that, and there's kind of, <coughs> my understanding is that there's no science around proving this. But if you want to be a collaborative organization, you could change your working environment. You could actually change the physical space that people are in. So for instance, does it encourage collaboration to have wide open office spaces with no partitions? Or does it encourage collaboration if you can um, put lots of meeting rooms around for people to kind of go in and do breakout sessions and things like that? So if you go and talk to interior design type people that do office spaces, you'll find people that argue, argue both ways. But my point is that there's a lot more that you can do to encourage collaboration rather than just installing a piece of software. So as a final slide, bringing all of it together, so this is a bit where you know, try and avoid you going, mm, yeah, okay, Simon, all made some sort of sense, but what do I do? These uh, are 10 steps that I actually put in the report back to the client that had to do SharePoint governance, okay? Um, and there was more detail to it than this. The first thing to do is, as we've already said, recognize that there's no such thing as a SharePoint project, there's only change projects, and you need to involve much more than just the IT department. This is something you'll hear a lot about, recruit an executive business sponsor. One of the things that you need to understand about your organization is what is the attitude of the board or your senior execs to technology, okay? Because if you're in an organization where they are hugely enthusiastic and recognize the value in technology, you're in a really good place, and you're probably also in a significant minority, okay? Most organizations, IT is seen as a cost center, and new ideas coming out of IT, yeah, yeah, okay, we've heard it before, but we, we need to be convinced. So you have to be realistic about this. You're probably not going to get your managing director or your CIO to get on board with, with your project, but just go as high up the chain as you can, okay? The rest of it really, I'm not gonna go through them um, all in detail because the, the rest of them really is going back to the governance model. So get your strategy team, have that first meeting, okay? So what should be on the agenda in that first meeting? The things that should be on the agenda in there is what is SharePoint, how are we going to use it, what are our success metrics? You know, as I said, SharePoint could be a 10 year project, okay? So don't get too excited about what you're gonna achieve in that first meeting. Please do. Mm -hmm. How do you tell them, look, it's, because most of, the, most of the things are three years plan, isn't it? Now you say 10 years. How do you convince them to say, in 10 years, is that not what SharePoint 2000 will look like? No, so I'm not suggesting that you would have a detailed, you know, a detailed plan that tells you in 10 years you will have deployed this functionality and, and things like that. What I'm driving at really is, you know, obviously there's this idea of, um, we use the term, it's a terrible term, but we use the term confidence horizon, okay? So basically the idea of a confidence horizon is the further into the future that I look, the less certain I am about what the outcome will be. So when you're looking at this idea of a 10-year plan, okay, it might be that you say, okay, 
we recognize that what we're actually trying to do here is to fundamentally change the way that people work and the way they interact with information. So that's kind of a high level goal. You might say, for instance, um, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on these parts of our organization because that's where the value in the cost is. You might then say that we're going to have an incremental strategy where we're going to have a SharePoint project that delivers, our first project delivers something in three months and we know that we're going to do incremental steps after that. <coughs> but you only really need to know what your first two or three steps might be in detail, okay? Because obviously doing a detailed plan for 10 years out I'm not suggesting that you do that. It's more of an aspect, it's more of a vision. Remember the maturity model that we looked at? Yeah? I think that's probably a better way of, of expressing it. So the maturity model that we looked at, you might say, you know, I want to be at stage six in about 10 years. How would I know whether I'm, I'm doing that or not? Okay? So much more of an aspiration and a vision than a detailed plan. Um, the rest of it really speaks for itself. So, you know, get your share, SharePoint strategy team together, build a business case, define a SharePoint strategy, agree the governance model. Are we having one team, three teams? Are we going to go for a center of excellence? Are we going to start with one and, and move to the next? Get the IT people in place. One of the first things that you need to do with the IT people is make sure that you've got the right skills in your IT um, organization. There might be a skills gap that you need to fill quite quickly. Um, and then you need to bring in your business impact team hold the first meeting and get them to be your user adoption strategy. That's the end of the session, unless you've got any questions. I'm going to be here for a few minutes anyway, packing up. Uh, are there any questions? Stunned silence. Did everybody have a wonderful time? Good. Thank you all very much for being here. I appreciate your time. Thank you.